This is a reflection I shared at the AMBS Pastors and Leaders and Deep Faith Conference in a response to an Alan Kreider book. The chapter I responded to was called Christians Are Made, Not Born, Catechesis and Baptism. Believing, behaving, and belonging. Those three words and their place in faith, forma for faith formation kept kept coming back to me as I read this chapter and prepared to share. Christians are made, not born. But where do we start? Looking at the early church described by Alan Kreider, the pattern laid out seemed to be behaving, believing, belonging. Yet when I look at the practices at, in my church today, it flips to belonging, believing, behaving. Catechism in the early church started with what you did, your habits and interactions. As those started to shift, the why behind it was added. Scriptures, the life and teachings of Jesus, and starting to get theology in your head and heart, assuming that your hands and feet we're already beginning to work in that way. Then the last step was belonging. The entry point being washed in baptism. Belonging involved being in worship and joining with communion. Today, I hear from parents that they want youth activities to be fun. They want young people to just be together the idea that faith will just come, it will rub off somehow if we are in proximity. They long for a sense of belonging with other people of faith for their children, but there is almost a fear that we can't make that too difficult. I am reminded of an activity we used to do with our leadership students, teaching them to work with youth. We would split them into three groups and give two groups a broom. For one of the groups, they held their broom very close to the ground, a low bar, and invited people to jump over it to gain insider status into their group. For the other team, they held their broom at waist height or even a little higher, a high bar, and invited people to jump over. We gave them five minutes to try and convince those in the spectator group to join their group by jumping over their broom. Charismatic recruitment ensued. Sure, the low bar was easy, but they let everyone in. Those with skill or long legs could clear the high bar. And aren't those the kind of people we want on our team? Shouldn't there be some excellence? Or do we want to make sure that everyone is welcome and included, no matter their skill level? Some people had to practice and try a few times before they cleared the high bar. But the rejoicing when they did was exuberant. When it comes to our children, baptism and communion, I see churches wrestling with this very thing. Are we low bar? Isn't the Lord's table and the grace of God extended to everyone open and welcoming? Didn't Jesus come for the least of these? So shouldn't the little ones be welcomed into the heart of what we do? Or high bar? There are things that are worth waiting for and working towards. What does it mean to be shaped and formed in faith and then come to the table? What does accountability look like if there is nothing and no one to be accountable to? Should we build anticipation and longing so that the act feels special and not like some everyday thing? We seem to want our kids to belong, feel safe in church, and like these are our people. From that space of insiderness, faith is shaped 
and beliefs are formed. Growing out of that belonging and believing, our actions start to change. Our behaving shifting in response to believing that has risen from belonging. How does this look in your church? Where is your entry point? We are busy people. Can we expect or demand that people take time for faith? At my church, we are committed to being a safe church. As part of that, we require that adults who are working with children have background checks and go through an approved adult training, which includes topics of boundaries, recognition of warning signs, and how you might handle a disclosure of abuse. Because of the pandemic, the trainings have become videos that can be watched online. Four hours of videos. As we met, met to discuss getting new adults involved, we wondered if four hours of online training might be prohibitive, that some people might say no, and thus we would lose them as leaders, teachers, and mentors. But what matters to us most? If we are committed to the safety of our children, then shouldn't we prioritize the training and understanding of adults, thus requiring this time? What do we really require at church anymore? Should we require things in faith formation? The lives of young people are full with school, with sports, with music lessons, with choir, with theater, with forming the resume they will need to get ahead in school and life, right? The early church spent time together Time for morning teaching and biblical study, time for meals and worship. I long for this kind of space in someone's life to be this influential and transformative for their faith. Do we take our faith seriously enough to give it that time? And this raises a further question of faith being attractive enough to appeal to and draw in those who are not yet people of faith, as well as the children of the church. Alan Kreider wrote, unlike many churches today, the third century churches did not try to grow by making people feel welcome and included. Civic paganism did that. In contrast, the churches were hard to enter they didn't grow because of their cultural accessibility. They grew because they required commitment to an unpopular God who didn't require people to perform cultic acts correctly, but instead equipped them to live in a way that was richly unconventional." End quote. Where is your focus as a church? I dream of people seeing us and wanting to be in on what we have. There is so much good that I see in my church community, but I see many young people who are not hungry for that faith and that relationship with Jesus. We get blinded by our busyness. They are too full to con connect with a spiritual longing. Maybe you are familiar with this, my constant lament. In my congregation, we are working together at a faith formation dream team. Gone are the days of sending children to the basement with a Sunday school teacher to have their Bible lessons. Instead of grief at that not returning, what is our invitation to dream of new ways? allowing us to break the patterns of how we have done things and see what we are invited into in this current reality. What is situational and what is wrapped up in this cultural moment and what is timeless? I don't wanna to return to hours on Zoom and young people do not want to interact with me or their peers in that format. 
But when some of the busyness was stripped away during lockdown, we had time and space to read the Bible together, to ask questions of our faith, and to build some community around saying, I don't understand that. I don't know if I believe that. I'm still figuring that out. Our dream team is asking what robust catechism might look like today and going forward. We are wrestling with, do we ask too little of young people or are we just asking in the wrong ways? How do we mentor young people and walk with them? What could a community of studying the Bible together look like? Finally, how do we do this together when we can't be together? So much of what shaped these early Christians was eating together, studying together, seeing each other in day-to-day -day life. How do we do that in a pandemic and not wear ourselves out? I don't have many answers, maybe you do, but I'm all in for the wrestling until we figure this out.